I don't. It just that's not doing it for me. It just shouts debate. I mean, it's it's like you know how you got that gavel for Congress. I'm just thinking when I see that gavel, I think of debate. No, it needs to have Thales Academy speech and debate on there. Why? Because that's our school. Okay. I'm following. Those are the two genres of forensics events that we do. I know you don't do any speech events, but I am bound and determined that we have to recognize our speech competitors. Well, oh yeah. I mean, if any of our speech competitors are listening, definitely recognizing you. We're just trying to design Haley, a cool here's shirt. here's a shout out Haley. as our longest term speech competitor who at least puts up with uh, all of us debate people. Yeah. Putting we, up with debate people is so much harder than putting up with speech people, I would I, think. Well, Haley, I, I don't even put up with Haley. She's awesome. I know. She is. And debate people are awesome, too, but they're, they're definitely... They're definitely special people. They're hard to get around their own of their own kind. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of What's the Res, an ongoing conversation about the current resolutions in the world of high school debate. My name is Josh Herring. My name is Ethan Delves. And today we are here to get back to one of our core purposes of this show, where we are today going to be discussing the resolution for November and October in Lincoln Douglas debate. Ethan, what's the res? The United States ought to eliminate subsidies for fossil fuels. I'm sorry for the cheesiness. I've been making really bad puns. Do you know how many people have asked me the question, what's the res in the past month? Really? Yeah, it's for some reason they just picked up on that. They're like, wait a second, what is the res? And then everyone's asking me this now. Do you just tell them what the current resolution is? Yeah, I just say it changes every two months. Nice. (laughs) Well... So, uh, we, we've got a, I, I think this resolution has gotten more interesting the deeper I've looked at it. So, uh, I, I figure on uh, today we should start with uh, some notes about the resolution, look at the definition, and we'll kind of run through AF and NEG thoughts. Okay. But, Ethan, give me your initial take. I know you've not done too much digging into this. You're still working on uh, prepping for an October case, but... Yeah, uh, I'm always down for an initial take. Good, what's initial your take? Initial take is that this is a very, this sounds like a really public forum e type policy-ish type resolution, but it has the word ought in it, and it's an LD resolution. So you get to attribute values to things that values should be attributed to, which is everyday stuff that people talk about. I mean, civil disobedience in a, de- in a democracy is morally justified is great. It's a little more lofty since it's the... Um, it's a beginner's topic. It's great to dig into. It's one of my favorites of all time. But this is something that people who think about the environment and fossil fuels and what we need to do about government subsidies can dig into, but you can still attribute a value to it, as I think arguments should have a value attributed to them in real life. So I think it's great. And I, it's going to bring together the most important parts of two different worlds. I, 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 I somewhat agree, though I will confess this is going to go against some things I've said on earlier episodes. For quite a while, I was initially stumped for the neg on this one. I think AF has so much ground. I don't see a ton of ground for neg on this resolution. And I think that'll become clear as we go through. Yeah. So this is and in part because this does strike me as a, as a lot closer to a proposition of policy than a proposition of value. Yeah, except there's not really a plan that it warrants for, but it, it does seem like a really policy. I, well, I mean, it does. It, you could... You could ask about it. You I could mean, make a... You, know, you could come up with a plan. I think I could see AF saying, all right, we're going to eliminate subsidies, but we're going to redirect those funds, and we propose instead to subsidize alternative energy development, to subsidize uh, these specific colleges that have done really well with research and like, development. No, why? Like, I'll just point it straight back to ought and I'll be like, great, why ought we do all that stuff? And they're well, going to have to ought every single one of those impacts, and I'd love to see them do it. Which you could do. I mean, I you think can, you, I mean, you, yeah. can, you, can, you can justify all of that, because I could... So, uh, let me see if I can actually defend what I just said. If I was going <laughs> to... That's, that's literally what goes on in my head right. every time something comes out of my mouth. So, <laughs> if I was going to suggest... All right, so my plan here is that we're going to redirect these subsidies over to uh, alternative energy. I'm going to say we ought to do that for our highest value of environmental stability. 
and, and I'm going to justify it on those grounds and say that through developing alternative energy plans, we're going to create a more sustainable environment long term. And sustainable source of energy. Is rather than using a consumable source of energy that is inherently harmful to the natural environment and eventually harmful to the human environment through pollution and lower air quality, then this is actually going to already looking to solve various problems. Which I, I think satisfies your moral demand. Which, yeah, thought. which is good. You're not going too far into the whole policy thing and getting too right. detail oriented. Which I'm not saying LD doesn't use detail because it does, but you can't ignore the value and the principles with right. it. Affirmative it seems to have this double win right here. It's like, look, we need to eliminate subsidies. So wait, that's great because the government's using less of this money or it's going towards better things. So win there. Plus sustainable environment and this and that. And it's sustainable energy too, which is great. Negative has all of the time in the world to say, wait, too good to be true. Like, this is what I see as one of those as seen on TV pitches where it's like, cook your eggs in this plastic thing and they'll come out perfect. <laughs> or like, the, a scrub daddy or whatever. I don't know. Like all, I mean, that actually works. It, it's a Bed Bath & Beyond. It's actually pretty good. But the ones that don't work, like the massage chairs, like the shiatsu stuff, that kind of stuff. But neg... Okay, wait, back that up. So just, just to make sure we're clear, our current simile is that... The affirmative case is like a shiatsu chair. Could you please explain the connection <laughs> the that you're seeing? The here? affirmative case is a pitch that is too good to be true without any strings attached. Got it. Strings okay, attached. good, yeah. good. I just want to make sure we didn't kind of rush down the road of a really of an easy simile without actually explaining the connection. Yeah, the only reason I'm thinking of shiatsu is because I like was talking about to my uncle about as seen on TV stuff, and he brought up shiatsu chairs, and I thought it was hilarious because we get my grandma massage like chair stuff for like every Christmas that we, or like heating pads or something. She loves that stuff. So yeah, that's my analogy. Thank I enjoyed you meeting your uncle, by the way. It was nice to us. And uh, he, uh, is, that's the uncle who, he subscribed to our premium channel, right? Um, I was my cousin. I oh, think, okay. Did, yeah. I knew it was somebody from your Ohio He listens trip. to a lot of the cool. episodes though. So maybe I'll pitch him the premium stuff. Hey, maybe so. Uh, okay. So the other thing I was suggesting there as a kind of on the fly plan, uh, alternatively was, uh, R&D departments at universities. So I think you could easily look at, I would probably organize that under a value of progress and looking at technological progress mm -hmm. and be ready to defend that on, I'd, I'd probably want to research, find two or three major technological breakthroughs that have come through university research. There's a ton and that's not hard to find. And then say the best way that we can use government funding is to have a safe investment strategy in continued scientific development that's going to solve existing problems and future problems. And it sounds so airtight. Like who wouldn't want that, right? Well, Again, I mean, that's, yeah. Like it's, you, want, you want people to become smarter through these research exactly. things. You want better solutions. Everything's going to be better. We just need Which, to cut the subsidies. So <laughs> all of that, well, now, that, and that, now my plan that I was, plan, both those plans did not involve cutting subsidies. They involved redirecting subsidies. Right. This is eliminating subsidies. But eliminating the oh, subsidy. Oh, there's a question. No, yep. no, no. I, I think, I think you still, your plan still works. You're eliminating the subsidy, which doesn't mean you're just burning the money into, like, oblivion. Like, the money's still there. I guess that's true. You I'm still eliminating subsidies for fossil fuels. I'm yeah. not eliminating su the subsidies. It's like you're wholesale. eliminating that channel for where money can go, which makes sense. Like that okay. money can still go somewhere else. Now, do you agree with me that it's hard to see the ground on Neg? Uh, I think that at first it's really difficult to see the ground on Neg, but when I looked a little bit closer, it seems like the affirmative is making a lot of promises through this. And the, my first move on Neg would be like, how dependent are we on fossil fuels at the current moment and how much money is actually going into this? Because the, the one word that really helps neg out is eliminate. That's, that's a universal. That means everything's done. And that, I mean, maybe the affirmative could try to patch that up a little bit. Like, wait, we could phase it out or grandfather it out like this and that, whatever. Like, 10-year plan, you know, those classic responses. Either way, it says eliminate subsidies. So neg has to come back with some sort of urgency. Like, wait, why can't we do this? Maybe we could... Maybe the neg can try to perm the affirmative here. Like, yeah, all your stuff can happen, but we can't just cut people off from their energy supply. That's, that's my instinct on neg. It's, it's almost okay. like, it's almost just like a repul like it's a repulsive instinct. Like yeah, I, I see affirmative has so much stuff. I'm like, whoa, like hold up. You know what I mean? Right. But you don't see an immediately accessible, easily, easily drawn negative ground for Neg to write a constructive case on. I, your, your strategy there is already on the offense from Neg. Yeah, Neg I don't really ready see, to go against Ad. I don't really see a negative mindset or worldview on this topic. I just see an urgent... Re it's like if someone came to Congress and said, look, we need to do this, and I'm the person sitting there listening to this being pitched, and I'm going to be voting on it. 
whoa, hold up. Like, what are the implications right. of this? Like, you need to think about this a little bit harder. Not everything's rainbows and unicorns. Which, that, that, that makes sense. I think that, though, I, I don't like that as, an, as a, the only strategy that someone uses, if only because it means that I don't, on Neg, I don't actually have anything of my own to bring to this case. I would just bring how you, I would take a couple of examples, if you could find any, or maybe help make this idea more clear, of how we can, we need to predict the affirmative's plan or their strategy for where we're going to put this money or what our priorities are going to be and show how we can do it in a safer way. Mm, okay. But again, no. d does that mean we're still eliminating fossil fuels? Because the neg would say maybe we could reduce them to this and eventually the market will take over and fossil fuels will be used in a negligible amount. But we need to be careful that the neg is not the affirmative with a slower plan. Right, right. Well, uh, this is the only time that I've looked at it in five years of looking at LD cases that I've looked at L this resolution thought, man, I might want to try and figure out a K strategy to run on this one. I mean, feel free, because I've, I've never ran a K. Have you ever run a K? Maybe no. College? Well, no. we need to get I, back with uh, Ruth Patterson and Nate Privet, who I was just interviewing on Ks and policy debate. They could definitely help us out with this. I still have not listened to that episode, and I'm sure by the time this one drops, that one will be up, and yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing that one. I think that uh, the cap capitalism K... Cap K. I, cap K. Yep. I think the Cap K could be pretty, might might be effective here, because if I understand that one correctly, that's going to be targeting a lot of the assumptions that capitalism is inherently good. Mm -hmm. And if the right, the right AF case is run, um, one, there's a good argument, I think, to say that subsidies create a market distortion, and that to have a stronger mark, free market economy, we need to get rid of these subsidies. If they run that strategy, the cap K maybe might be a very effective strategy to then assume, well, hold on, maybe we should not assume the inherent goodness of capitalism. I can see the affirmative having some of that language intertwined in their case. What because I see them running more towards the environmental side than I do right. the capitalism and money and decentralization type of thing. But what if there's anything I've learned about K's, it's that almost any K can apply to almost any resolution, which is tiring and it's not or I don't know. I know. I'm definitely it's, quoting someone when I say not the best because I have a friend that literally says not the best all the time. Well, it, but, it's, um, it's, I think it's a good reason it's to It's like just a one avoid size them. fits all because here's yeah. the thing, here's the thing that changes the link. You know the the link at the beginning of the the K is the so link that's to the, the resolution. Point, right? yeah, 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 you have the link and then all of the literature against whatever ideology you're going against. So, so all you have to do is establish to, that link, and then the rest of it you is You have canned. to blame affirmative of ascribing to a certain ideology, show why the ideology is wrong, not why the affirmative is wrong, and how we can fix their mindset to have a better debate. Ah, okay, yeah, you, did, you did learn a lot with that interview. I'm not, I'm not ragging on Ks. Like, I've never tried it. I'm not going to say I'm completely against it, but at a face value, the one thing I don't like is that they can literally apply to anything as long as you change the link, which kind of deteriorates from the whole debate experience. It does. I, I do think, I mean, I, I can see the K as a last chance effort, but at least as a judge, and I, I don't know that anybody who listens to our show will ever show up on, as, a, as a student in a judging round, but uh, I have this literally in my paradigm on, uh, on, on Tab Room as a judge that I, I like resolutional debate. And so if you're going to run an argument that is off the resolution, for me, at least, to win my ballot, you have to make the case. You have to explain to me why there is no ground for you to make your argument. And in this case, I could see someone making the argument that because the negative team accepts the idea that fossil fuels contribute to global warming and climate change, and they are that there is no ground for Neg to run their case. I, I can see that argument being made. I don't know if it will be persuasive or not, but I yeah, can see the argument. That'll definitely be made, but as long as Neg has a, an, a the ability to perm the affirmative and be the voice of reason here, like, whoa, wait, don't get... Like, don't get ahead of yourself. We can do something about this, but we can do something about it in the right way. Uh, as long as they're not eliminating subsidies. You could reduce subsidies. You could promote the free market to the point where these subsidies and fossil fuels may not be needed to the same degree. There's so many alternative routes you could take that I think negative is not so much negative. It's just anti-affirmative, which is what negative really should be. But again, there's not really this major constructive argument that's being well, articulated. Well, I've, I've got at least a couple thoughts there. We'll come back to you. Let's, let's back up because I think we've now oh, yeah. um, we, we've skipped over definitions. Uh, so I, I think it sounds like we're already in agreement on eliminate. As just literally we've got to remove everything And Do you think subsidies. anyone's going to find a way around that? I don't you know, think someone always should. tries. Yeah, they, they might try, but that's I think I see room 
uh, for based on the Atlantic's the Atlantic article that we'll we'll put in the uh, show description. Um, I do see room for definition debate in this resolution. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of play with the word subsidy. There, there's there's wiggle room there, and we'll get to it in a second. I don't think there's going to be play with the word eliminate. That's pretty. They're going to say eliminate over time. You know that nobody's going to argue for just snapping their fingers and like trillions of dollars uh, going that, down. Which the is drain. which is fine. Which is fine. Yeah. yeah, that that really is fine. Uh, that that doesn't bother me if they say okay over the next ten years we're going to phase out existing programs and by uh, 2029 or 2030 just to give a nice even year number because that that at least strikes my ear as better. By 2030, we will have eliminated all fossil fuel subsidies. That that doesn't bother me. Yeah, that's fine. So okay. keep going. Um, are you familiar with the formal definition of a subsidy? Giving of funds by a government to an industry for the goal of reducing the price tag. Excellent. It's on the outline. Off of the outline. Yes, exactly. But no, I do know what a subsidy is. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. I, I, that was one that I, I had a feeling our some of our audience may or may not be familiar with the formal economic concept of subsidy. Uh, I got more familiarity with that when I was talking to some of my cousins uh, who are they're they're from a farming background and they they live in Kentucky. And yes, yes. They're very familiar with that of subsidies because there are so many agricultural subsidies, and of course the subsidy comes in. It's it's often introduced as a uh, when looking at the market and seeing there's uh, there's cheaper foreign goods coming in. And so we want to lower the cost of a company to produce their, their product. So the government will subsidize the production. They'll, they'll mm -hmm. give money to a company to make their product at a lower price, letting the company then theoretically lower their price point or we for consumption. Need, or we have an insane consumer demand for a product like food, and we need to feed people, so the government's going to help them out by giving that farmer money. I actually have a friend that is literally obsessed with agriculture, and I know you're going to listen to this too. You know who you are. So big shout out to you. I have learned so much about agriculture and subsidies. Like that, that's why my mindset when I hear subsidies is centered around agriculture. Yeah. It's because I hear about agricultural subsidies so much. It's literally They're, just the first then thought. Your, your, your unnamed friend has probably also told you about the, what I, I at least find this really fascinating. Did you know there are people who get paid not to grow corn? What? Can I get paid not to grow I corn? I wish I could get out on this. It would be great. I would gladly take a monthly check I... for not planting corn in my backyard. <laughs> but there, there was a time in American agricultural history where I, just the corn market was flooded and the, the law was passed such that the corn subsidy was given to farmers because the, the part of the, the subsidy story usually involves... It's, it sounds so demeaning to call it a sob story, but it's really a sob story. It's kind of this idea of like, oh, if we change this, that's going to have hundreds of farmers are now put out and they're uh, put out of business and they're all going to starve and lose their land, which may very well be true. Uh, and that, that, that's not to demean the suffering of folks who go through that kind of hardship. Um, but they're, they're, that's, the, that's the story that's told. So like literally... There's millions of dollars given out every year by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to farmers so that they will not grow. Can you corn. imagine just you're about to plant some corn and then the car, the government car pulls up at your house and you're just like, no, wait, don't. <laughs> <laughs> running out, an FBI agent running out with a check. Stop. <laughs> Stop. This In is the name of the law. emergency. Don't grow corn. <laughs> yeah, so that, that too is part of the, that, that, that's. One of the very few things I know about subsidies. So I thought I'd at least get that out there. Okay. Now, when I was reading up on this, this is where uh, subsidies is really the, the, phrase, the word here that has definitional play going on. Um, so the big study that I found dealing with uh, subsidies for fuel uh, on a global scale comes from an, an International Monetary Fund working paper uh, that was published in May of 2019. Uh, this is literally entitled IMF Working Paper, Fiscal Affairs Department. Global fossil fuel subsidies remain large. An update based on country-level estimates prepared by David Cody, Ian Perry, uh, Nigaya, Peter Lee, and Baoping Shang. And so this is May of 2019, so it's relatively recently. They came out with a shockingly high number. Uh, according to this IMF Working Paper, Globally, the fossil fuel industry is subsidized by $5.2 trillion with a T by governments all around the country. Well, now, that number is really high, and I was struck by that because I was like, when I first hear fossil fuels, the first thing I think of is gasoline, mm -hmm. which, of course, is only one of them. Your fossil fuels, we're talking about oil, natural gas, and coal. Coal is a declining industry, 
But natural gas is going strong, and my goodness, big oil has so much. Their profit margins are huge. So where does $5.2 trillion come into Oh, I got globally? this. I got this. So I was just thinking about this. This is all speculation. I'm not an expert on oil harvesting. But there's a lot of different facets of fossil fuels. And when you just have the phrase for fossil fuels or subsidies for fossil fuels, you have to harvest the fossil fuels. I mean, there's, there's large companies involved. You need to process the fossil fuels and you need to transport them safely. And I, this, just ha this just occurred to me that mining or I guess drilling for oil, mining for coal and drilling for natural gas. I know oil and coal, those are really dangerous things to do for a lot of people. Is there any way that NEG would say we need to eliminate subsidies to prevent people from getting hurt by uh, harvesting this sort of thing. Because I know maybe. like that would be a very minor argument. And again, Affirmative's plan is probably going to be like phasing this out yeah, over time. That, that, We're not going to eliminate fossil fuels that. all over the place. But I was like, wait a second. Like that's, this is dangerous I, stuff it, too. It is dangerous. Which is obviously going to raise the cost for a lot of companies, which warrants even more money going to the system. So maybe. that's probably where that number comes from. That's not where that number comes from. The number doesn't come from companies needing to needing like, to like, take extra cover measures. liability measure liability insurance. Rate. No, it's not that. I mean, there's large safety costs that go into it, and the company saves money by getting there are, like, in general but from getting money from the. Government. That's not where five point two trillion dollars comes from. I think it comes from the cost of drilling. And you know that from how difficult it is to drill oil. No. Okay, where's the money no. come from? Where do you so, think? So that fi the the trick here is not that I mean there is there are subsidies that are going for the cost of drilling oil. One of the subsidies I'll mention in a moment is specifically attached to the cost and probably tied to the danger. So you, I'm not completely disagreeing with you, but that's not where you get to 5.2 trillion dollars. Uh, so the Atlantic did an article on uh, on this. Let me pull that up real quick to get the title. Uh, that is titled The Hidden Subsidy of Fossil Fuels by Robinson Meyer on May 9th of 2019. So it's directly in response to the publication of this working paper. And what Meyer gets into in that is the, there's a huge discrepancy. When you look at the actual dollars that are, in terms of globally, the actual funds that companies are receiving from governments, the actual dollar amount is $296 billion. Not even one trillion. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that the IMF is calculating a projected series of costs based on the harm that these companies are doing through the production of carbon and pollution into the atmosphere and in the various environments around the world. So you're telling me that 5.2 trillion is a projection that actually hasn't been given. The global amount of subsidies that have been given for fossil fuels is two hundred ninety-six billion. So what? Yes, that's that, exactly okay. What I'm, I'm going to just say that's nothing. Well, for so, the entire globe, like think about it. That's that's almost half of what we use to run our military for one year. Yep. And this is the global amount of money. Yeah. So what? Like, who came up with this resolution? If this is just like that, no offense, but like, if anyone's There's, listening to this, uh, one of the I was looking on our Instagram page, and uh, what's the res follows a few different speech memes. People. Oh, we follow. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of them. That's put my up bad. A, I love those. Things. Yeah. No, it's great. I love like they're 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 hilarious. It's they're. they're it's like running into like a whole field of inside jokes. I mean, exactly. It's, it's, so it's great. It's love. It's great so, when you can. But one to of them like was that. just mocking. I what I assume is this resolution because they're literally. It's really hard to come up with stuff because there's just not a lot. But so part of what's going on here is that I think we have room for everyone's favorite debate. We need to be ready for a definitions debate on the word subsidy because if AF comes out. With this $5.2 trillion figure, NEG has so much ground to say the vast majority of that number that comes from the IMF working paper is hogwash. It's projection and it's calculation based on environmental harm, not calculation based on actual money given through a subsidy. Now, the specific language here that will be important for making that argument is that what you're getting at, the Atlantic goes on to explain that the difference here is a subsidy that's given, a pre-tax subsidy is a standard subsidy where it's literal money given to a company. What the IMF is calculating is based on, they, they give it the term a post-tax subsidy, where they're calculating the effects there and assigning an economic value. So for example, they assume that there is a $40 harm for every metric ton of carbon produced by a company. How do you... I'm not even going to ask. I mean, I, I, you remember our difficulty in calculating 
for starters, it's really hard to calculate carbon impact yeah. or even carbon production. And, and we just talked about in that last episode how the UN like has an, isn't even conclusive or all the scientists right? Board, right? So it's really difficult to even determine what these subsidies are if you go off of the IMF data. I have to say, this is not an exciting turn in the resolution for me at all. I mean, like, because that is like, wait... There's almost no money put into it, but then affirmative is like, we need to get rid of them. And Neg's like, why? It's barely any money. And then it was like, well, then why do you want to keep it if it's barely any money? Like, that's like, really? How well, much? Is, how much of this is America? Do you know? Oh, I don't. I don't know. I, I have not dug into it. the working paper because I I attempted. It's 39 pages long. I hope to have time today to read through it. I did not. I am not keen on going to a tournament to argue about 300 billion dollars of subsidies. I'm going to well, the that's tournament. Global. I'm going to argue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going. Well, like, we're going to argue. But... Before, you, before you abandon all hope, because this is not Dante's hell, we're not abandoning all hope before we enter here. All right. Um, let me give you a little bit more stuff I found. Uh, this is from the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. They have a fact sheet on fossil fuel subsidies, and they're looking particularly at fossil fuel subsidies in the United States there that we are go. germane to this resolution. So there is stuff here. Okay. Uh, it's just not going to be the giant number of $5.2 trillion that I suspect folks may be really excited to be like, whoa, we're talking about the trillions. Yeah. And no, we're not. Well, we're right. not quite there. So uh, I'm just going to read these, and the, the titles of these are, are mostly self-explanatory. The first of these is called the Intangible Drilling Cost Deduction. Uh, that this, uh, this is focused on deducting the costs that incur from drilling a new well. Like environmental costs Ex or maybe like the residential areas around? We're talking or... about specifically the uh, commercial cost. If a company is going to drill a new oil well, it's probably going to cost, may cost them two or three million dollars to bring equipment in, drill the well, and begin production there. So they get to, this deduction lets them write this off. Uh, the, apparently, the Joint Committee on Taxation estimated that eliminating these tax breaks would generate $1.59 billion in additional government revenue uh, in, 29, in 2017 or eventually $13 billion over 10 years. So that, that kind of indicates how much of a benefit companies are getting from that. Uh, there is also a percentage depletion that allows companies to uh, account their assets differently, so they, they get to do that, and that lets them save a bit of money. There is a credit for clean coal investment. Clean uh, coal. Let's see. This, uh, these subsidies create a series of tax credits for energy investment, particularly focusing on coal. In 2005, Congress authorized $1.5 billion in credits for integrated gasification combined cycle properties. I have no idea what that means. Gasification. Gasification. All right. As that's long as like, it saves money. It's kind of like the noise our building has been making all day. Oh, There's been man. lots of building gasification. Have you seen, like, uh, people have made these, like, iMovies, oh. and it has, a, like, a boat, well, but I then was, they play the audio from the speaker. Uh, I was watching students on Apple Classroom earlier, and I caught a student on a... Uh, there were 49 slides on the slideshow, but it's memes about our building and our recent house system that I'm rather... I really kind of want to see the whole thing, but I suspect our building has made that meme list. Yeah, I mean... Anyway. The speakers have been pretty crazy. Lately. They have been. Also, there is a non-conventional fuels tax credit. Uh, so, let's see. I don't think this one currently... Oh, yeah, this one's out. This, was, this provided $12.2 billion uh, in aid to the coal industry, but it ended in 2010. And there's a distinction here because that, all of those above are direct subsidies. And now there's a next, there's a, the next list is about indirect, indirect subsidies. subsidies. So that, that could be interesting for that definitions debate, too, if we're, if we're counting out. Does, or, yeah, how, yeah. How, how, how AF defines that is going to be important. That list begins with last in, first out accounting, uh, but this allows... Uh, oil and gas companies to sell the fuel most recently added to their reserves first, and it allows their most expensive reserves to be served first. So that just lets them kind of shift their assets around differently. You've got the foreign tax credit, something called Master Limited Partnerships, Domestic Manufacturing Deduction. So, uh, but this one is also inactive. That was, uh, uh, it was repealed by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which began in 2018. So there are a variety of subsidies to dig into uh, on this. Okay, any other thoughts on that? I think I'm good on definitions. Okay. I think that'll do it. 
So I um, uh, let's let's shift gears then to affirmative strategy and thoughts and negative strategy and thoughts. Uh, okay, I would begin on AF. Now I would look at this first and foremost on, on an economics angle because I would like to avoid a climate change debate. I don't know that it's possible to avoid a climate change debate with this resolution. No, it's not. It's, it, you'll see it. Yep. But I would suggest one strategy beginning looking at, and particularly if you are a traditional LD person and you want to look in at, look at some of the philosophy stuff, there's a decent amount of material on uh, the way in the Austrian economic school looking at the, what, the fact that subsidies create a market distortion. Companies should be able to exist on the profits that they make, and if they don't, then they're going to crash. Well, subsidies are an intervention in that market interaction. Subsidies are a government giving companies a break in some way, in which case you're not really getting the market signals that you should as a company. You're not producing your product as efficiently, as cheaply as the market demands, and you're being allowed to do that for longer. So that's it's ultimately going to be better for the economy as a whole under Austrian theory to get rid of all subsidies and just let the market do its thing. Makes sense. Okay. All right. So, Ethan, do you want to take our, uh, our climate change? Yeah. Narrative? I mean, again, like I pointed out at the very beginning of the episode, there's, it says eliminate subsidies for fossil fuels. My first thought was the market distortion, but I am not as inclined. I also use that argument probably because it's a good one, but we're seeing how little money actually goes into this, the market distortion is not as compelling as it would be if it were in the trillions of dollars. That's the only thing I'm going to point out there. But the fossil fuels are resulting in more carbon production is going to be a, a, a huge argument. Um, I'm, if someone argues that on AF and I'm on NEG, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions about proving the coherency of global warming, the global warming narrative and our impact on it and how eliminating, eliminating $300 billion is going to make an impact on global warming. I'm just going to pull a slippery slope kind of thing there. But again, that's an argument we're going to see a lot. And then the last argument would be a waste of taxpayer money, which is an argument you could use for pretty much anything in public forum. And since this is a public forum-esque resolution, I expect it to appear here as well. Which I think here, your, your, my biggest issue when looking initially at this resolution was the initial assumption that big oil companies are flush with cash at all times. So why on earth are they getting a break here? Yeah, so, and here's the other places we could put it. Everyone's happy. Like, yeah. affirmative story. Yep. What about a value? Are we going to do values last? Or gonna... I, I, I was already had this so heavily over in policy realm. I honestly have not. I know because I didn't see the values value. Value. But talk... you said progress earlier. That wasn't a bad I, idea. That's, I mean... It's not. I mean, I think you could you could tag progress for the affirmative value. You could try. I, I do think. Uh, I think environmental stability or um, yeah, something like that would also work for the AF value. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on, on AF values if there? You, if you were going to go all in on market distortion, you could use our points A and C. We were talking about the market distortion and then waste of taxpayer money. It seems really offstandish from this resolution because you're completely ignoring the fact about what the subsidies are. You're just saying, in theory, like right. taking this money is bad and it could be used in all these other places. I could run that case for literally so many resolutions and you would have no you would know what I'm talking about. But it you would not know that I'm talking about the specifics of that resolution. You just know the theory. Which I could see working as almost a two-prong approach where you have you run two contentions. Your first contention there is really focusing on the misuse of funds. And your second contention is really looking at how the uh, these taxpayer dollars as a misuse of funds are actually going to fund something that is harming the environment generally. So you almost Which take is, those as two two major arguments, and that would be that could be a substantive AF case. I think. I think that's the as far as the AF is going to go, and I'm okay with that. I, I don't really Which see any problems with this that. Is, I, I hated it when I heard it, but it does kind of fit. I think. The value I was telling you about I heard at the Duke tournament last week of negative utilitarianism. Oh, man. That just blew my mind. I know. I, 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 I thought that was like saying someone ran utilitarianism on neg, but we have no, no, no. negative utilitarianism. Right. Can you We're, explain that one more time? Yeah, and it's this is – I've not done enough reading on this. I don't know which thinkers are attached to it. At some point, I want to read up if on any. it. And maybe, but <laughs> if there's substance there, I thought it might it might merit a whole LD paradigm episode yeah. at some point. But the idea that this debater who he made it to uh, semifinals at uh, the Duke University Duke University uh, Invitational this last weekend at uh, or uh, over October fifth, and uh, uh, his argument was that negative utilitarianism is it's taking the same utilitarian framework. 
the greatest good for the uh, most people with the least harm or the least evil. Yeah. But it's really, it's flipping the focus and it's saying, how can we preserve the most good while removing evil from the equation? I don't even think that works. I think that's exactly like when, Mill, when Mills wrote his essay on utilitarianism, that's covered. Like what we're looking for is to increase good and that involves keeping good that's already there and then eliminating oh, harm. So I think it's just a way of putting a spin, it, a completely I, I, it sounds... unnecessary spin. It's all in the essay. I mean, we're it, part of being happy is keeping good things. I mean, I, I'll pull it from the essay. I actually we, had we it. We still. I, I need to reread that one. And, and me to, too, you, because I, I lost like half of my notes on that when I transferred. Right. So we both need to reread it, and and then we really should do a util episode. As long as we we need a we need like a good track out time for that, and we'll yeah. do a really long episode on it. But I think that fits what we're talking about in terms of you could look at eliminating subsidies would reduce an evil of market distortion in the economy. And it would increase good through removing these subsidies that are causing, that are incentivizing harm to the environment. You, and it's interesting how utilitarianism can be used for things related to like the Austrian school of thought and the Keynesian school mm -hmm. of thought as well. Because you can apply making as many people happy as you possibly want to to literally anything. So it's a really, right. it's a it's like a fungible sort of framework, if you will. Well, so let's let's move on to Neg then. I've only got one thing on Neg. I'm I've never actually tried that thing where it's like my sole contention is, but this oh. might be the time. I this mean, might be. <laughs> I, and I would love that because you know what? I have four cases to write in two weeks and I'm like halfway through one. So, yep. so maybe, maybe just the move. all in on this. Um, so as far as value goes, I would actually, I would hang this Again, this is kind of painting me to even say this, but I would hang this on social justice as the value or economic equity, something of that nature. And the one argument that I've got for this, uh, there's a Vox article that I read that was looking at these, uh, was looking at these subsidies, and it talks about the fact that these subsidies exist in part because, again, subsidies often have a sob story attached to them. Not to say that that's not true, but that's the nature of the thing. Uh, the sob story in this case is the mental image of people who are economically disenfranchised, poor people, in inner cities, places like Chicago, Atlanta, Detroit, New York, etc., not being able to heat their living space. Because costs are more expensive. Because the cost of heat, because particularly we're talking about fuel and natural gas, not so much oil, that, that's going to be gasoline, but Coal and natural gas are both are both used and have been used historically as fuel for producing heat during the winter. Now, this is much less of an issue in cities in, uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line, but if you get to large cities in the north, we're talking frigid winters. We're talking months below freezing. And if you cannot actually heat your space, you can die. I can see the companies almost threatening to to raise their costs to a certain point if the government's going to be taking a ton of their money away. Like, I, and that's just like this weird thought that I had. Like if a company was in Congress with the government there and everything and everyone's about to vote on this, I can see a lobbyist being against this and saying, look, this company's not going to be happy. We're going to see prices go up and look at all these people we need to be taking care of. But again, could you, could you revert that money towards those people who would have trouble covering their energy costs. So you take away the money from the companies, free market does its job, and while it's doing its job, you take that 300-ish, like $296 billion, and use it to... Which was a global a, number, so the which, American, okay, so American slice numbers, of that I mean, is what, smaller. Like, I'll, I'll just say $70 billion. Like, it's probably wrong. We're actually probably a huge chunk of that. But even, even if it's $70 billion, you could use that as sort of a buffer for those people who wouldn't be able to pay their costs. You could start supplementing their costs somehow, maybe. Possibly. And that's where the funds could go while the companies are trying to lower their costs again. So, I don't know. That's like a little, like, retaliation to some sort of argument that would be made. But right. it's not very coherent. It's just a thought. Well, I mean, I, one other thought on that. I know I only had one, but I, I reached out to a couple of debate coach friends and... Uh, this is actually is from uh, Nathan Orlando, who helped me out. He helped us out with a resolution episode uh, for uh, Nationals. Yeah, for, he was uh, the NSDA. violent revolution. Yeah, yep. that was him. Uh, he thought that he had a thought that I don't understand terribly well yet. But his thought was that anytime you're dealing with fossil fuels, you are also tying in Middle East relations and you are messing with the formula of how do we keep Middle Eastern countries happy and yeah. such. So if we're talking about a, we were talking about subsidies that have been tied to uh, companies bringing in oil from inter overseas. If we remove those subsidies, we could threaten our oil supply from the Middle East if that, that triggers retaliatory tactics from OPEC countries and, and companies and so on. 
So those are some thoughts on NEG. Uh, so we're either looking there at social justice or we're looking at uh, international security or stability uh, and, and really trying to maintain the status quo on NEG and, and, and so on. Uh, Any so, values? For, yeah, for, no, those were like those social the, justice yeah, okay. and, and international stability. That's all is what I'm asking. I, I, so, I worded yeah. that question so bad. That's all the yeah. values. All right, that makes sense. I'm, yeah. I think that's good. So does yeah. that cover pretty much everything we have? I for think episode? so. I, 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 I suspect this may be an episode that we may come back to in a – or we might come back to this resolution in a few weeks once we both get deeper into it. Probably with we, an interview or something to probably, help us out. Probably. And uh, I know I've got uh, – I just talked to one economist, a guy named uh, David DeVell – who he agreed to an interview, so I've got to set that up. But right. he's going to come on to talk, help a little bit about with the subsidies idea and why are sometimes subsidies a good idea and why are sometimes a bad idea. So he might be able to help with the economic analysis of this. All right, sounds good. So I guess we'll just wrap up this episode. I, I think I'm so. happy with it. All right, so if you have any questions about this epi episode, if you enjoyed it, if you want to reach out to us, please feel free to do so at whatstherez at gmail.com. That's W-H-A-T-S-T-H-E-R-E-S at gmail.com. Feel free to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit at whatstherez underscore. And you can find all of our information, all of our episodes, social media, YouTube channels, all that stuff on www.whatstherez.com. And until next time, work hard, speak well, and seek the truth.